Welcome and thanks uh, for catching our presentation for the 2020 um, Desert Fishes Council virtual meeting. My name is Tyler Pilger. And I'm David Probst. And today we're going to be talking about some work that we've been doing um, surveying uh, the genetic diversity and genetic variation of speckled dace in the Gila and San Francisco drainages. First off, um, I want to acknowledge some folks that have helped us with um, all of the field sampling and everything throughout uh, while we were doing this work to start with. Um, with a special shout out, thanks to um, Megan Osborne and members of Tom Turner's um, genetic lab at the University of New Mexico. Basically all the genetic samples and everything were done through, through his lab. And then also Keith Guido at Kansas State University um, and his crew of field technicians that have helped with all of the sampling. Um, for during the various uh, sampling years that we did. Uh, and then Lex Snyder at the university, who was, used to be at the University of uh, New Mexico's Museum of Southwestern Biology. She helped us um, get all these samples stored properly um, for long term. Uh, and then so funding for this projects, for the various projects, the various research projects um, came from New Mexico Share with Wildlife Program, uh, with a state wildlife grant and Desert LCC. Most recent um, Funding to, to do this work and for this presentation today came from uh, Tim Fry and the Bureau of Land Management. Okay, so Dave, why do you, why do you think uh, speckled dace is such an interesting species to study? Well, it's probably one of the most widely distributed uh, fish in the American West and trying to, well, recognizing that there are a number of different morphs of the species is, challenged people and to try to figure out what are the relationships with these different species, subspecies, cryptic species. And it's been a challenging, or been a challenge. And uh, a number of people have attempted to figure it out. And it's only now with the advances in uh, genetic approaches that we're beginning to get some appreciation and understanding of the differences among these different populations. And Steve Musman's dissertation was a major step towards more complete understanding of the uh, variation and differences among these populations. Yeah, no, his, he, he did a great dissertation and I hope he doesn't mind us um, um, including some of these uh, figures from his, from his dissertation. So, you know, it's really important and, and this is a kind of a really interesting, evolutionarily interesting species. It's got a very, very broad range. Um, Lots of uh, numerous subspecies and, and endemic forms, and I think that's been very challenging for the taxonomy, as you said, um, and in part because the the species evolution has been driven by various hybridization and introgression events. So it goes, it becomes isolated, and then secondary contact later on. Um, and then there's you know very small isolated populations uh, that still contain a lot of cryptic genetic variation. Uh, along, you know, throughout its range. So it's very interesting to study for that respect. Um, and in, in New Mexico itself, so one of the things that uh, Steve Musman had pointed out was, was looking at the different evolutionary significant units. And, you know, just within New Mexico itself, there's th uh, three different evolutionary significant units. Um, the Upper Colorado, which includes um, the San Juan River and its tributaries, the Little Colorado River, um, there's not a whole lot of uh, known um, samples from the Little Colorado in New Mexico, but it's potentially there. Um, and then the one that we've been focusing on in the Gila is this evolutionary significant unit down here and trying to, trying to characterize how much variation is, there is on a smaller scale, a smaller spatial scale. Uh, so our sampling on, in the Gila, we've been doing it for various different projects. Um, looking at, you know, um, genetic and um, ecology of, of the fish community in this, in this region. So we have our sample sites here indicated. Um, uh, East Fork, Black Canyon, this is, this is one area. Uh, this flows down to combine with the West Fork Gila River. Um, and here we have our sample sites, West Fork, Middle Fork. This is the, the, on the Hart Bar property, New Mexico Game and Fish property. This little creek here, um, and then this grapevine sample. We've also uh, collected some samples from the San Francisco River. And as you can see that way down here, 
you know, the San Francisco flows in um, uh, quite a bit higher up than this. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have samples from there yet. Uh, we're hoping to get those sometime in the future. And then this one isolated population here in Blue Creek. Um, and so Dave, you, you also said that there was potentially other isolated populations, right? Yes, in addition to Blue Creek, there are populations that are occur in the tributaries to the Sapio River, Sapio Creek, that's tributary to the Gila. There's uh, also an isolated population in the upper reaches of the West Fork, and Mogollon Creek at one time had a little population up in the headwaters of it. There's also what is presumed to be an introduced population in the Members River, which is just over the Continental Divide from the uh, headwaters of Sapio Creek. Great. Um, and so, is, you know, our, our work's gonna kind of focus on Blue Creek. Um, why do you think uh, Blue Creek is so unique? Well, I think <clears throat> if you look at Blue Creek, you do not, you're not struck by the fact that, boy, this really looks like good speckled days habitat. Uh, you might think that tr chubs or uh, long pen days would be more uh, suitable for habitat like this. And so that was one of the first things that <clears throat> got us interested in Blue Creek was that it just did not look like speckled days habitat. Then the realization that it was an isolated, you know, 20 some kilometers upstream uh, of the uh, Gila River confluence and that 23 kilometers is uh, almost always dry. So it was an isolated small population and a habitat that really didn't appear to be uh, particularly good for speckled dace, but yet there was a nice strong population persisting there. So that sort of intrigued us initially. Yeah. Um, so what we're going to talk about today then is summarizing the genetic samples that we've collected, um, looking at genetic diversity, uh, genetic structure to try to quantify how isolated uh, these populations are, um, and looking at another metric of diversity, which is genetic effective size. And we, d we have these samples from multiple time points now. Um, and so it gives us a unique perspective on this species. Um, and with that data, we'll be able to really kind of assess the degree of isolation of that Blue Creek population, which is, which is what we're you know, interested in too. So our field work, um, our the methods in the field are no different than um, capturing fish elsewhere. Uh, we use a combination of seining, backpack, um, electrofishing. Um, a, a, several, several of these projects have been, you know, just uh, collecting the samples and then uh, measuring them. But mainly what we do is we, we go out there and we collect a tiny bit of, bit of fin clip, uh, fin tissue. And then our samples, uh, here is our table of samples over time. So um, I'm hoping that our, our pictures aren't covering up the, the top row of the Blue Creek, but we had about 80 samples um, from Blue Creek from 2010, 12, 14. Um, these, other tribute, these other samples down here are, um, of these other sites are, this is from the East Fork and Black Canyon um, that flow into the West Fork. We've got uh, several samples from the West Fork and I, I will point out like uh, throughout this presentation, I may just mention West Fork, but I really am referring to um, to all of these samples. I've just been grouping them into like the West Fork and Middle Fork region. Um, and then our one sample from, uh, from San Francisco, and we got that from one year. So I'm gonna quickly run through the genetic uh, methods, lab methods here. Uh, we have an assay panel of 10 microsatellite loci. From that, um, from those microsats, we can look at allelic richness. This is a metric a summary statistic that accounts for differences in sample size. So when you see uh, allelic richness, it's, it's independent of the difference in sample sizes. Uh, we're also looking at the number of private alleles, which is um, alleles that are unique to a particular region uh, that we're looking at or a particular sample site that we're looking at. We also um, estimated genetic structure using the, um, the pairwise uh, FST values. So this is a genetic summary statistic that tells you how different um, uh, allele frequencies are between samples. We use two programs, um, genetic assignment programs. Um, now this is structure some of you may have heard of and then Bayes-Ass. So these are two 
they're similar in the fact that they're genetic assignment programs, but they have different models behind them. So like if you opened up the hood and looked underneath, uh, they have different like, models uh, and they, they're trying to predict or they're trying to estimate different things. So structure is one where you're trying to identify um, genetically distinct groups. Um, this Bezos program is actually using the assignment uh, methodology to infer proportions of recent migrants among populations. And then um, we also estimated genetic effective sizes using the program any estimator. And we have two different types of effective size estimates. We have a single sample, um, which is the linkage to equilibrium method. Um, and this, uh, this is, tries to detect a signal of linkage to equilibrium um, that would be stronger for highly inbred populations and weaker um, for very well mixed or very large populations. Then we have the variance effective size, which is uh, two samples. So it looks at two samples over time um, and it looks at the difference in allele frequencies or the change in allele frequencies from one time period to the next. So higher, um, bigger populations would have less change in frequencies than a small population, which is subject uh, which has a lot of genetic drift going on. So the population, so the allele frequencies are going to change a lot faster um, in, that, in a small population. So that's what we're looking at here. And we're going to just jump right in um, to these results. So looking at allelic richness, um, this plot here on the left, the sites go down or uh, on the y-axis here. And then these are temporal samples. So each box here represents a temporal sample and the white indicates we didn't have a sample there. And then the gray indicates that we did collect a fish or two, but wasn't a large enough sample to include um, to estimate allelic richness. And so the important thing with this is to show this color indicates the level of allelic richness, which ranges from uh, six to about 10. So the lighter the color, the greater the genetic diversity in allelic richness there is. And basically, we can see that West Fork, um, East Fork, Middle Fork, all of these, Little Creek here has slightly less genetic uh, allelic richness, but they're all fairly similar in um, allelic richness between these sites. San Francisco has very, very high um, allelic richness. Um, and then if we look at this Blue Creek though, look at the, the dark color indicates that Blue Creek has very low allelic richness. And that wasn't a fluke, it's been consistent um, from each sample that we've collected from there. So then we look at the private alleles. And again, this is uh, alleles that are unique to a specific location. Okay. Um, so basically, these low levels of private alleles between West Fork and down here to Grapevine indicates that this is a well mixed population. None of these sample sites have that much um, unique genetic diversity, except for. Black Canyon here, which we saw has fairly, uh, fairly high level of unique private alleles. Um, Blue Creek has a similarly high level. Now, San Francisco here, we'd say, wow, that's got lots of unique alleles. Well, you know, that's just from one sample and from one uh, location. So if we were to sample more locations in the San Francisco, that would go down. So it would likely, very likely be um, comparable to the, 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 private alleles, the number of private alleles that we saw in the West Forks, Middle Fork, and East Fork, if we, if we had sampled more locations. Um, but important point is low diversity in Blue Creek, but lots of, um, some high level of unique private alleles. Quickly, or uh, moving on now to looking at ge the genetic structure. Basically, um, this, this plot here on the left, um, each box or each, each thing is a, is a sample site um, by time combination and they're, and they're pairwise. Okay. So Blue Creek over here um, is compares to Blue Creek here. Okay. And then the color, the boxes are color coded by the pairwise FST. And again, FST is a measure of how different genetic samples are. So the darker this color, the more differentiated samples are. So it's very clear here that these Blue Creek samples are very similar to themselves, no surprise. But they're very different from 
um, from everything in the West Fork and also very different from the San Francisco, which would be these boxes here. And if you look at the San Francisco samples, they're very different from everything else, even Blue Creek. So basically what that says, what that's saying is that uh, Blue Creek and San Francisco are highly differentiated from the upper Gila and from each other. Um, this plot over here is one I did a while back using just 2010 data um, from the Gila and River, uh, the Gila River and Blue Creek samples. So it does not include San Francisco. This was an isolation by distance plot I tried to put together to see how the relationship of F how um, FST was related to the stream distance between these locations. And so these really, these uh, points down here are the sites that are really close together, which, and so no surprise, they're very genetically similar. Um, but this is Blue Creek. So Blue Creek is, is uh, you know, set, set some distance away from these other populations, these other locations, but very, very um, high level of genetic differentiation or high FST values. So this, this pattern has is, is, is been consistent over time. Um, another way that we looked at genetic structure was we used the program structure. And um, some of you may uh, be familiar with it enough to know that like, this is a program where we set a priori how many different genetic groups um, we think there could be. So we set a range of what we call K values, as K values is a number of uh, unique groups. And so I got two plots here, one at um, K equals three. And so this, and K equals four. So these plots here are, the, the Y axis is the um, percent, or is the, the, the probability that that individual was assigned to this, this location, this color. So individuals from San Francisco here, uh, all, very, or always assigned to uh, the San Francisco population and individuals from Blue Creek always had high probability of being belonging to Blue Creek. West Fork here includes all of our samples, West Fork, Middle Fork, Little Creek, um, Harp, West Fork, Heart Bar, a grapevine, um, and these all group together. And then these are, this is our East Fork and Black Canyon samples here under the East Fork, and they group together. So this is great. So very distinct. Blue Creek is distinct from San Francisco and West Fork. Now, if we set the K a little bit higher, we, would have, we were expecting to actually maybe see that East Fork might pop out as being different than all, all the stuff in the West Fork. But that was not the case. So, prog so this, this program still, still figured out that what San Francisco and Blue were different, but could not distinguish um, between um, any of the sites, any of the samples in the West Fork and Middle Fork and East Fork. Okay, um, another program that we used, um, BASAS, which was trying to estimate uh, somewhat recent migration rates. This plot here is, is from the results from fish that we used just from 2010. So again, this doesn't include San Francisco, but it does include Blue Creek. And the way you read this plot is each of these boxes are um, pairwise comparisons and um, the diagonal is a uh, site as the comparison to itself. So um, I just want to point out here that, okay, so one here, this one box, this is how you would read this. This box indicates um, that uh, the fraction of individuals from the fraction of uh, the sample from heart bar that could be from Little Creek. So somewhat, so, so there's potential that Little Creek has contributing individuals to our, the nearest sample location, Heart Bar. But if we swap that and we look at the probability that individuals in Little Creek came from Heart Bar, it's almost none. So it suggests that there's some level of, eight or some degree of asymmetric gene flow uh, with this species, uh, at least between these sites. And then these tan boxes here indicate that the program had a very hard time assigning individuals at that location to that location because all of these sites were fairly genetically similar. Um, but except for Blue Creek. So Blue Creek shows almost no evidence of contributing individuals to the upper Gila and it doesn't show any evidence 
that individuals from the upper Gila have contributed to Blue Creek. So further, further supporting um, the isolation of Blue Creek. Okay, uh, genetic effective size. So this is the first method, the single sample estimator. And we have Blue Creek, East Fork. Again, East Fork includes both East Fork and Black Canyon sites. Our single site from San Francisco. And then I've grouped all of our uh, West Fork samples together. So this includes Middle Fork, Little Creek, so on and so forth. Uh, our y-axis here is on a log scale. And, um, some, and I want to say that there's a lot of uncertainty in these effective size estimates. And that's part of, partly because of what, this, th what the method is trying to do. It's trying to detect a signal of inbreeding in a sample. And if the sample size is too small and the signal of inbreeding is too weak, you're going to have a really, really high confidence intervals. And that's kind of what we see here. But the important thing with that is that these red lines, which kind of are about the, the lower 95% confidence interval for these, indicate the, uh, the, mo the plausible minimum effective size. So that at least the, si the effective size is that, but is very likely larger than that. So that's important to keep in mind. Um, now, and, and for, in terms of for Blue Creek, it is interesting that um, it's a little bit lower than West Fork, um, but it's not substantially, uh, it's not, well, it's hard to say significant, but it's, it's not that much lower than the effective size in um, West Fork. So we can definitely say that there's no, that, that Blue Creek is at least healthy in that there's not a lot of inbreeding going on. Um, now this is our two sample estimator. Um, and it looks at the um, change in allele frequencies from one time to the next. Again, um, y-axis is the um, is the log scale. We have our Blue Creek, we, East Fork samples. We don't have San Francisco because we only had San Francisco from one year. But the x-axis here are the year comparisons. So comparing um, samples from 2010 to 2012, 2012 to 2014, and then the uh, the last one is 2010 to 2014. So again, and this red line here is the minimum plausible um, effective size value. But what's important with, what's really interesting with this um, is that Blue Creek appears very stable over time. These samples, this, these don't change that much. And then this lower bar is similar to what we saw with the inbreeding effective size. So that's a good sign when inbreeding effective size is similar to variance effective size because it, in, it indicates a stable population. But we don't see a stable population with uh, the West Fork and Middle Forks. So very, very low uh, effective size in two, comparing 2010 to 2012. Um, and then higher in 2012 to, to um, 2014, but then, okay, so you're seeing that big signal. So what that indicates is a huge shift. There's a very large shift in allele frequencies uh, between 2010 and 2012, um, and which would indicate that there was substantial population turnover um, it, between, it, you know, in West Fork, Middle Fork, um, and, and that whole group of samples. So one of the things that is responsible for that um, are these large fires, um, Whitewater Baldy and um, the Miller fire. So Dave, you wanna mention anything about these fires? Well, <clears throat> the Miller fire burned, well, the Miller fire was 2011 and then the uh, Whitewater Baldy was 2012. Both of them burned extensive portions of the West Fork drainage and they, their perimeters overlapped quite a bit. <clears throat> and you can see from this picture, both East the Middle Fork and Black Canyon is, is that post-fire flooding really uh, altered, modified, changed the habitat considerably. And there were impacts on the fish populations, but the uh, fish assemblages surprisingly uh, recovered in, in the comparatively few years, particularly the Middle Fork. The Silver 
uh, Black Canyon where the Silver Fire affected, it took a little bit longer for it to recover. It still hasn't completely, but it's in the process of recovering. Yeah, so we, we threw in these pictures to show just how much um, those fires affected the habitat. But yeah, we, uh, you know, our, our colleague James Whitney and Keith, they've done papers that looked at like how the communities shifted because of these fires. They're very interesting. And so, but, but it, I think it's really intriguing that we actually see the effects of these in the genetic signatures, in the genetic effective size signatures. Okay, so that is the genetics that we looked at. Um, quickly wrap this up, you know, Upper Gila and San Francisco, they appear to be very large populations with lots of genetic diversity. Although again, we need to sample more in the San Francisco, um, but being large and well-connected populations has a benefit because, you know, when you have these disturbances, there are individuals um, it, that have found refuge or then in unburned tributaries or unaffected tributaries that can recolonize, um, which is not the same with Blue Creek, where it is a very small isolated population or SIP. Um, and it's, it's, it's isolated. There's clear genetic evidence that it's isolated and it's harboring unique genetic diversity. So if that population is lost, um, that genetic diversity is lost as well. And um, there are, again, there are other um, small isolated populations out there. Uh, we, Dave mentioned that um, the Sapio Creek, um, potentially the Membras, um, that would be very interested, that we'd be very interested in looking at. Um, because they are at risk uh, for, um, from, for extirpation or uh, from wildfires and drought. Um, and climate change is going to make things a lot worse too. Um, and the, the problem with them being isolated is they're not likely to get recolonized. So once they, if they get wiped out, they're wiped out for good, unless we as humans do something about it, um, recolonize it. Um, and then, yeah, so this last point, Dave, you want to talk about that? Uh, well, the, there's an interesting question is that the, uh, for instance, Rio Grande Sucker, uh, is got over the uh, low divide between the headwaters of the members and headwaters of Sapio Creek, moved west, colonized the uh, Hilo about four to 5,000 years ago. So the question then is, is that did speckled dace, instead of uh, go the opposite direction, move from Sapio Creek into the members because there was a good viable population of speckled dace in the members. So was that a natural occurrence or a human mediated one? And so there are a number of situations like that with other species and the speckled dace that um, we think need be, would be interesting to look at to see which way the fish are moving, how much of it is done on, on their, by themselves or how much might be hum, human interference. Yeah, and also pointing out that, you know, our maps didn't show it, but the, the upper San Francisco drainage backs up to the little Colorado. So there's also potential that there were um, either natural or artificial anthropogenic translocations of this fish between these two evolutionary significant units, uh, between the little Colorado and um, the upper San Francisco. So uh, another uh, would intriguing question um, and certainly worth um, looking into in the future. So if anybody has any questions or wants to contact us with some comments, um, please feel free to email us. And then that's it. Thanks. Thank you.